you chart? I'm a doctor. No, it's important. Next, um, Janet is going to do one more feature from. I'm sure she's going to tell you. Welcome up, Janet, one more time. Yeah. Seriously, did my feature when I don't have a wig on. <laughs> Hi. Um, yes, hello. I would like to share with you some poems that you have yet to hear from the Samuel Witt 2023 book title Testament. Um, I am doing all things from the first part of it because we are right at the one year anniversary and people are going and I'm going to sniff and then missing you already and we'll have to take a group photo or something after this before another round of poetry. But I'm going to share with you some post Roe v. Wade poems from the Book of Testament. I have copies of it here. I would double plus love it if you would like one because I'd love to not carry so many back with me when I go back home. <laughs> this uh, first poem from the book that I'm sharing with you is titled Evil of What They've Done. When women are not treated as equals, when women make still less pay per dollar than any man and are stunted from advancing, it's advancement in the worst place, I suppose it's not hard to believe that supporting women's health care is also an insurmountable task. After the religious right, a usually male in the often more rural half of this united nation used their interpretation of their religious dogma to push women back to the dark ages by overturning legislation that has existed for all of my sentient life. They removed women's choice and in turn placed so many people health-wise in such grave danger. We women felt a cushy kind of comfort knowing that Roe v. Wade is on our side. Not even Democrats push to make our rights more legal, more permanent than a single Supreme Court decision. And now that the religious rights, usually male, in the often more rural half of this united nation, push women back to the dark ages, politicians and policymakers now work furiously, even against party lines, to codify Roe. Now, a bipartisan bill has been made, sponsored by Republicans and Democrat senators, that in order to be agreeable is so vague that it doesn't uphold anything. Abortion rights groups hate it, and the, all the nitpicking battles over the technical phrases in this bill, it makes the message in the bill lost to the average American. I think my husband now, well, who once said, may I quote, there is no task so simple that it cannot be made impossible through the actions of a bureaucracy. <laughs> Which is exactly what is happening here. This inability of the U.S. government to accomplish anything for women. Even if the Kane Collins bill never passes, Senator Kane still holds great fear. I think life post Dobbs is a series of tragedies. So for he fears, like me, that it may take too many medical tragedies against full-grown women before our lawmakers realize the evil of what they've done and correct the mistakes they've made to women. A series of tragedies makes me think of how back in the day, and still, I suppose, there would be what now seems to be one mass shooting from one crazed male almost every week. People protested, wanted something radical passed into law, but there were never 60 votes, so nothing changed. Apparently, after one tragedy too many, the Senate decided to move, passing a gun bill one day after the overturning of Roe v. Wade. But don't worry, tragedy is never far away when it comes to guns and more restrictive laws. Violent killings are still up, and daily shootings still reign supreme around my hometown, too. So, whether change is eventually made in the laws for women or not, all prospects scream that no matter what happens, it looks like we're in this fight for the long haul. It may take more than a miracle 
for women to be treated equally by mankind. <sighs> Since I don't believe in miracles, we'll just continue fighting until something like women's health care isn't so insurmountable after all. You could hear that noise that was this discordant noise in the background. I try to make something, I don't know if it worked or not. But this poem is called After All We've Accomplished. With discordant noise or no? I did, after what is that where did the discordant noise go? I have no idea. Oh, whatever. My voice is discordant enough. You're good. This is titled After All We've Accomplished. I don't know. After the honor roll, after acceptance of the third best college in the country, after the dean's list, after the big city job that paid more than the men she dated, after battling for our lives, after piloting an airplane, after jumping from an airplane, after swimming with sharks, after swimming in the southern ocean and camping close to the South Pole, after taking care of the house, after keeping finances in order, after raising the children, only after putting our lives on hold. After being a television star, after being a rock star, after being a movie star. After traveling the world to bring food and water to third world countries. After running for Congress, after being a senator, after being the Secretary of State after holding a seat in the Supreme Court, after winning a Nobel Peace Prize for using my brain, after being the Vice President, after running for presidency, after doing so much, after accomplishing so much, some bastards who know nothing of the plights of women still try to know and decide that they know what's best for a woman's private parts. They try to come along and strip us of all of our most basic rights, our rights to our bodies, our rights to choose. <laughs> Haven't we fought this battle before? After all we've accomplished, what more do we have to do when religious conservatives believes we're worth less than something that's never even lived? Why does the weaker sex choose to take away the rights of the sex who truly has the power to choose when life begins? And really, why if we have been pigeonholed so much that we have to just work again to prove to the ignorant that they're wrong? I need to have a little better argument with one the with the poems I like this one. This one is titled on a Sunday after a sermon. On a Sunday after a sermon, services in some rural town, uh, wait, the town's not that small, it's just that small-minded, uh, overheard conversations from three men in a restaurant after they attended church, went something like this. I personally believe women are not as strong or intelligent as men. Uh, some women may appear intelligent, Take Marie Curie as an example. She seems smart because she is said to have discovered radium, but really, she relied on her husband Philip and took all the credit from him. <laughs> Real quote. <laughs> this church going man from that somehow small town also said something about the French not being the smartest either. <sighs> Fuming in my seat, I wanted to be able to strut over to his booth with. Her husband's name was Pierre, and if it was Philip, it would have been Philippe, and he helped her, the woman who worked with Einstein, and after her husband died, she took over his professorship while still doing her work. She was the one with the Nobel Prize who moved to France to work, and the element she discovered is actually named after her home country. <sighs> And this is when I remembered, when I realized that it is futile to point out these things when even uh, you can't even use reason or logic when the religious men have sexism on their side. They've already made up their minds. What good would showing them the truth do? 
And saying the French aren't even as smart doesn't help this ignorant man's argument when Marie Curie wasn't even French. But at least the French are smart enough to strengthen women's reproductive rights choices after said religiously inclined men, where this ignorant man is from, opted to take those rights away from women after the overturning of Roe v. Wade. This is the battle that every being faces now, siding with reason and logic and common sense versus siding with sexist religious dogma. And it might be tough when you're raised to believe in a god and your intellect pushes the boundaries of your religious faith. But, as I said, this is a battle when religiously stunted, small-minded men never check their premises and decide to li live on unfounded conclusions, choosing to ignore the truth. These are the moments when I hold my head in my hands and try to brainstorm over what my options are. And I understand that this is a nation where we can't expect to be given rights unearned, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It means that we can work to earn what we deserve, not to receive unearned gifts on a silver platter. But after we've had rights, that doesn't mean rights should be taken away when religious leaders beyond my control change the laws. This is why I hold my head in my hands while I still can, and I try to figure a way out of this. Who once again check your premises? Women do have the brains to do this. For it is now when I feel that as they take more rights from over half of this country, that metaphorically my hands are tied behind my back. I'm just wondering if they're going to offer to place a cigarette in my mouth and light it before the firing squad comes in and pulls the trigger. I don't think I'm going to have anybody reading the questions, so I'm going to do them both for this next poem. It is titled, Question and Answer Time. Since I've been researching women's rights post the overturning of Roe v. Wade, I should have known the questions would come. Can you tell me, in the United States, which state has the highest maternal mortality rates? We're sitting here at a brewery in Austin, Texas, so I can infer the answer is Texas, but I don't want to say it aloud. So they continue questioning. Did you know that Texas has the highest maternal mortality rate in the entire developed world? Really? Versus any other state and or country? And why is this questioner asking me these questions that they already know the answers? Or is this, this is their way of feeding me more data to inflame me, to elevate an, uh, elevate an already morally tumultuous issue? Then I was given a study where I learned in Texas, Republican-led state legislators slashed funding to reproductive health care clinics, and after that, the, the maternal mortality rate doubled over two years. But as I search, I find that the maternal mortality rate in the U.S. continues to exceed the rate of other high-income countries. But why? Is it having more cesarean sections, inadequate parental care, or, or is it more suffering from obesity, diabetes, or heart disease? Well, the slashing of funding for clinics might be a part of it, but the questioner then asked me, what about when a woman has an ectopic pregnancy? Now, since I'm not so wise in the ways of maternity, I had to look this up to learn that this is when a fertilized egg implants and grows outside of the main cavity of the uterus, most often the fallopian tubes. This is fatal for the fetus. Ectopic pregnancy is also the most common cause of maternal mortality in the first trimester. Oh, now we're giving back to that slash funding to reproductive health care clinics thing. Because in this case, Banning abortions would lead to a woman's death, protecting something that could never live. And for so many state legislators, seriously considering that human embryos for legal personhood with the total abortion bans from the moment of conception, 
Well, most human embryos die before anyone even knows that they even existed. Uh, a five-day-old blastocyst, a, a, a hollow ball of cells no larger than 0 0.008 inches, or 0.2 millimeters, with a high likelihood of disintegrating in a few days, means unbeknownst women are mass killers. And there isn't even a doctor alive who could prove that women were committing any sort of biological crime. Now, if you hear me bitch and moan about abortion rights and think I'm over the top, please realize that this debate is about so much more. These laws restrict the rights and harm the safety of women, while these same lawmakers forget about caring for the children once they're alive across this entire country. And these Bible Belt conservatives claim to care for an embryo and forget that something like 60% of those days old embryos don't even survive. They want to make more laws to slam that gavel down against womankind and choose to ignore the science instead. For, you know, I've heard these ads now playing on TV for men to take pills to increase their testosterone and to be more manly, alongside ads for the genetically defective men who get rid of their baldness, but that's another story for another time. But if they really wanted to look at the science of it, studies show that higher testosterone leads to a more laid back and relaxed mood in men where low T and increased levels in estrogen in either sex can lead to that anger response that mankind is labeled as testosterone-fueled rage. <laughs> it's really not. It's an estrogen-fueled rage, so let that sink in for a minute. <laughs> because maybe the Bible Vault Southern states don't feel it. But your law change, ch changes actually put women on some estrogen-fueled rage that fuels our fight against these backwards injustices. And although a penis makes half of the equation, once a woman chooses to carry a child, she becomes the ultimate life giver. And as I said, yes, a penis makes half the equation at its inception, but after that, this penis-bearing half wants to subjugate all women to a lifetime of living with his wrong choices. <sighs> Sorry if I sound like I'm ranting. It's just my estrogen-fueled rage that's working me all up. <laughs> no, wait. It's not that at all. This estrogen-fueled rage is only because those religious southern states are taking more rights away when they never had the right. Slave owners did this once, too, but, but your relying on an insanely old book with no basis of truth is not an answer. So, seriously, just read the evidence and let me cool down for a minute so you can go look at the proof. Go ahead, if you must. Keep asking me questions. If you listen, you might actually learn something. If, once and for all, you let the answer sink in. <laughs> this was a, a strange one, but I have to share it with you. This one is titled, Using the Nazi Approach to Women's Rights. <laughs> well, there you go. Now I'm going to change my tone to sound more feminine for this one. During the later years of World War II, the only people who were allowed with Adolf Hitler during meals were young women, whom were all instructed to keep the conversation light so they wouldn't contradict his megalomaniacal views. During those same years, Adolf Hitler became so concerned that enemies, and even people in his own party, would try to kill him by poisoning his food. So he kept a rotation of 11 women to taste his food first in case it was poison. Now, keep in mind, these women had to be of good Aryan stock, even though these women were to him exposable enough to die in case someone was trying to poison him with tainted vegetarian food. All these women fretted daily, wondering if they were eating their last meal. <laughs> when I explained this to someone, they wondered why Hitler didn't get Jews to taste the potentially deadly food instead if they were meant to die anyway. But, poison or not, I'm sure there was no way Adolf Hitler would ever give a Jew food fit for a Fuhrer. <laughs> 
for the Third Reich had no compunction with killing Jews, gypsies, political dissidents, but they would bend over backwards to keep every Aryan baby alive, even if out of wedlock, thanks to the Lebensborn program, to increase their German stock. <laughs> Keep in mind that a Nazi-era law that came into effect in 1933 as paragraph 219A of Germany's criminal code prohibited doctors from providing information about abortion as advertising abortion services in their attempt to, in effect, discourage women from obtaining abortions. German conservatives from the past four governments of Angela Merkel's Christian right kept this law alive, Germany finally uh, scrapped this law on the same day Roe v. Wade was overturned in the USA, proclaiming a broad counterpoint to the hazardous now U.S. treatment of women's rights. And now I hear, months after the overturning, that conservative political candidates are now trying to make themselves sound more moderate in the months preceding an election. Republican candidates are even scrubbing their websites of any past anti-abortion rhetoric, hoping, to, uh, hoping that those who disagree with them will, I don't know, not remember their once assaulted views on women, <laughs> on life that was actually living. A UN committee even slammed the U.S. abortion rights decision, which disproportionately affects racial and ethnic minorities from safety for women's reproductive rights issues. So, really, jump from the UN to the Geneva Convention's war crimes after uncovering the extent of the Third Reich's heinous acts throughout World War II? Okay. The Nazis' hatred for swaths of humanity seems akin to their hatred of women in the false delusion of claiming to care for clumps of cells that aren't even life instead. Wow. Thank you. Sorry, I hate to see that. This is the last poem I'm going to share with you. And I had to share it because there's something about us artist types. This one is called Oh No! Is art not safe from Big Brother? It is not. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, let's, well, let me outline more examples of how it's not, you rock on. Um, here's the poem. Remembering periods in history where it was the artists who were revered, leading decadent lives, I wonder if we artists now feel like we lead cushy lives, stuck aloof and aloft in our thoughts, too busy showing how life should be instead of fretting about how life really is, witnessing the oppressive laws against all women, say, in Texas, to suppress abortion rights. For I recently read that a San Antonio sculpture was marked with an abortion rights message after San Antonio approved a resolution re recognizing abortion rights. Now, keep in mind, this is coming from the state most suppressing women's rights with their laws. In Dallas, an art gallery is donating $50,000 of their proceeds to Planned Parenthood in vehement protests against SB 8, the state law signed by Governor Greg Abbott to ban all abortions after six weeks of pregnancy. It only made sense for the art organization, quote, to be a loud voice. Any impact we can make is going to be important. Other artists have joined this campaign as well, strengthening all of our resolves to do anything we can to support this cause. Because I am afraid I have also read that because of these new Texas laws, even artwork about abortion is legally risky now, as activists behind a recent installation about self-managed abortion in Texas now must include signs warning of the illegality of this in states where this is illegal. Consider yourself warned. <laughs> but, but haven't we been with the barrage of laws that have befallen us while artists now must include warnings about them like, accurately conveying the traumas of any step of any process so personal? <laughs> as art exhibits such as these display warning signs in bright orange against a shocking blue beneath a pair of ominous eyes, all are all too aware of the ominous underlying messages. The incredulous tone is now 
legal mandates against women. Yes. Ominous indeed. Ominous when artists must predicate their work, when the intent of their artwork is to, quote, advocate for a greater understanding, not to recommend or advise that any person do anything suggested in the arts. Because who on earth would want to act based on artwork, based on things that make you think? <laughs> who would want that? Thank you. state where it's a lot, a lot of people won't think about it because it doesn't seem to affect us as much, but by the passing of laws and by the changing of things like this, over half of the country is having problems with this for women's rights issues, and medications are being banned that people from all different groups need, and so this is why I wanted to share these with you guys. And if anybody's interested in a copy of the book, I've got extra copies of this one, as well as the one from last year, from 2022, Shattering the Glass Ceiling. I'm right over there if you need anything. And once again, thank you, West High. Thank you, the Gallery Cabaret. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.